Welcome to Being Boss, a podcast for creatives, business owners, and entrepreneurs who want to take control of their work and live life on their own terms. I'm your host, Emily Thompson, and in this episode, I'm joined by Kathleen Shannon to talk about developing your personal style as an outlet for exploring your creativity and expressing yourself. You can find all the tools, books, and links we reference on the show notes at www.beingboss.club. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to this show and share us with a friend. It's no secret that I have a soft spot for product bosses, those of you who embark on a business journey that includes making or curating physical products. And even if that's not the journey you've chosen for yourself, there's amazing lessons to be learned for all kinds of businesses from the world of product business, which is why you need to check out The Product Boss, a podcast hosted by Jacqueline Snyder and Minna kunlo Sitap, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Take your physical product sales and strategy to the next level to create your dream life with hosts Jacqueline and Minna as they deliver a workshop style strategy hour of social media and marketing strategies so you can up level your business. Listen to the product boss wherever you get your podcasts. Kathleen Shannon is the co-founder and former co-host of the Being Boss podcast, joining me for the first 240-ish episodes of this show, with several one-off episodes since. Kathleen is a partner and creative director at Braid Creative, a branding agency she founded with her sister over 10 years ago. Kathleen has always lived by capturing, shaping, and sharing who she is, whether that's with a blog post, a podcast, or on social media. Well, welcome back, Kathleen. (laughs) It's... (laughs) Good to be back. <laughs> again, again. Uh, we actually recorded the last episode that we did together yesterday, so it's especially kind of funny for us um, today in this moment to say that. But I think the most exciting thing is that you and I are taking a trip together this weekend. Yay. We're it going to NOLA, our so stomping long. grounds. Yep. Indeed, our stomping grounds. Um, We were talking this morning and you brought up the curse that we have been under for the past year, I guess. Yeah. There were two times that Kathleen and I were supposed to have gotten together in 2021 and my kid got sick both times. (laughs) both times. Um, And so we had to cancel two trips. I was going to go see Kathleen in Michigan. Kathleen was going to come to Tennessee to see me later in the year. And when we got together to figure out, well, then what are we doing? Like, I can't come see you. You can't come see me. You were like, let's go to New Orleans. And I was like, well, obviously that's what the universe was waiting for, was for us to be like, let's go to New Orleans. I know. And you're going for a being boss trip. So I was like, well, can I just come too, basically? So we're meeting up a couple (laughs) days early before you have to be on. I'm also going to be hanging out with some bosses, but it's fun because like, it's not my job anymore, but I get to pop in. Like I know, you know, there's such a shorthand having co-founded being boss with you and having been around so many bosses all the time. A lot of these are people that I already know or people that I know I'll get along with. So I'm really excited to kind of pop back in. Yeah, me too. Me too. I was thinking we haven't been there together since 2018, which feels like a lifetime ago, but I feel like, aren't we always there together? (laughs) I know. It really does feel that way. It's like every six months or something. Wow. We really haven't been there for five years together? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And I don't know that we've ever been there without working. Have we always been working while we're there? Yes. I mean, I feel like the lightest was we went for just like a photo shoot. So the book photo shoot, but that was also like, that was a lot of work. No, that Um, was a lot of work. (laughs) It was. That was some grueling couple of days. Um. So yeah, it's always been for work. And so we're going to be there for a couple of days just for fun. But three of the bosses who are in the C-suite right now were part of the VIP group from that 2018 trip. So it's almost like we're all getting back together five years later. Yay. I'm just really excited. And I know I've said this before, but I'm just really excited and really proud of our friendship. You know, like we owned a business together. 
we dissolved, you know, my partnership in it. I sold my half of being boss to you. And that could really, um, I don't know, like that could be a make or break moment, right? And it it, mm-hmm. it wasn't. It was definitely a no. place where, you know, we kind of probably individually had to like work su- through some things and like kind of create some subtle boundaries around like what we could discuss or not discuss. And I think with enough time and space, professionally, I'm able to come hang out on being boss a little bit more. I'm able to come hang out on a vacation in New Orleans. But more than anything, I mean, through all of it, like I've realized that you're one of my people. Like you are one of my ride or dies and it goes beyond business. And it was really scary knowing like were we so close because we had a business partnership together or had we actually become that close. And obviously, we're not getting the same amount of frequency that we used to get as far as seeing each other every day podcasting, even though the past two days, it's kind of been a little <laughs> bit like that. Um, but I feel like, you know, you're always going to be that person where we're like, we can just pick up where we left off and meet up in New Orleans five years later and feel like it's been maybe six months. Yeah, that's where we're at. And I'm really just proud of it. I am as well. I'm glad you feel that way. I was telling someone not too terribly long ago, um, I had mentioned something about like having a business partner and they just like get that face like, oh, and I was like, no, no, not like that. Like we're still great friends. And we started talking about a little because they were very curious about that. And I was like, actually, I can say with confidence that the dissolving of that partnership was one of the things in my life that I am most proud of period, how we were able to do that so amicably and yeah, and then be on this other side of it where we can just sort of like hop in and do whatever, whether it's very reminiscent to what we used to do together or just like a fun weekend in New Orleans and tax some bosses onto it and all of the things like it's it it really is. I I know that one day I will look back at my life and still feel like that was one of the maneuverings that I am most proud of. And you are also one of my people. Mm. And Mm. I think, you know, we've done a whole episode on this and I can't really remember what we said there as far as breaking up our business partnership. But I think that a big reason why it was so amicable is because we were having really hard conversations along the way the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like we never shied away from really diving into what our boundaries were, what our goals were, what our vision was. And a lot, most of the time that was aligned, you know, like most of the time we were on the same page, even if we weren't sure that we were on the same page, like we would talk it out. And the way that we started that business was very much under the guise of, you know, we weren't as like tight as friends then starting the business as we are now, I would say, but we still started it under the kind of understanding that our relationship was more important. It was like the most important thing, even though we didn't have the same relationship then that we do now. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we knew it was important. I think a lot of people, though, say like friends first, right? But like how often does that actually pan out? <laughs> right. Right. Like probably not as often as it's said, I would assume. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel the exact same way. I feel like, you know, our relationship has evolved so much over the years. Um, and we really made the thing that we were saying. I mean, it was true then, but like we kept it true, I guess. Yeah. Which is quite a feat in itself as well. Oh, I can't wait to eat with you. <laughs> same. <laughs> Um, But I think that, sorry, real quick, and then we'll move on to like what we're excited about for New Orleans. Um, But I think that a lot of people say friends first as a way to kind of have slippery boundaries. You know, I think it's like a cop out Mm. of having hard conversations by saying friends first. Yeah. Sometimes. Well, not us. (laughs) Not us. And not like not not in my partnership with my sister either. Like same, you know, like we're we have to say sisters first, but who sometimes that's like a really hard boundary to draw and to figure out and to navigate. That's that's a completely different scenario and thing to say, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Not the same. So we're going to New Orleans. It's gonna be so fun because we've got two full days, just us. We are going mm-hmm. to eat some food. We've been Marco Poloing and Google mapping and pinning all the places that we're dreaming about eating at. 
I literally Googled romantic date night restaurants in New Orleans because that is our vibe. <laughs> That's how we do. It is. It is the vibe. And I love that. David was standing there earlier whenever you said that on Marco Polo and he got incredibly tickled about it because he knows. He knows that that's the vibe. Um, So I am. I am so excited about just I was texting you and saying one of the things that I really want to accomplish out of this is I want like a long, slow, late dinner. I want to like get a bottle of wine. (laughs) I don't we don't have to finish it. (laughs) I know. I'm so scared right now between late and wine. I'm like, okay, one, my bedtime is like at (laughs) nine. So I don't know how late you're wanting to go. Two. Yeah. Well, okay. So East Coast though, nine is 10. (laughs) So it'll be late for me. Not so late for you. We'll have the same experience, but in different ways. (laughs) Is New Orleans East Coast or Central Time? Central. So it'll feel late, but not be that way. Yeah, so it's going to feel even later. Yeah, okay, so then that means later. we need okay, to eat dinner mind. at 6 p.m. But we can hang out there for three hours. Romantic date night my ass. <laughs> it's more like geriatric midday supper or whatever. <laughs> No, I love it, though. Same, same. I'm, I'm talking a big game. Okay, a glass of wine, not a bottle of wine. At lunch. <laughs> and we'll we are just... golden girls. We're going to be golden girls. <laughs> yeah, I think we're already eating late, kinda there. but being fabulous. I mean, eating early, but being fabulous. Yes. Yes. I'll bring my uh, caftan. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Perfect. I'm very excited about this as well. I can't wait to see what we get into, but mostly it's going to be food. And that is literally the most exciting thing of all. Well, speaking of caftan. Speaking of caftans, I am super excited about having this conversation with you today. This is a little bit of like a spinoff of um, of the personal branding episode that we did at some point in the recent past. So that's in the show notes if anyone wants to go find that. We talked about personal branding and we talked a little bit about personal style in that episode. And I wanted to come chat with you about personal style Because it is such an element of personal branding. It's also something that I think a lot of people, a lot of folks do kind of struggle with, like really developing and and like uh, owning their personal style. And I think that talking about it from two people who are creative and have a good eye, but have no like professional experience in being stylists, talking about what it looks like to develop a personal style could be a fun conversation. I'm here for it. I, Whenever thinking about this episode, though, I do kind of, I think I'm going to approach it just as speaking from a personal style point of view. I don't really know how to tie it back into personal brand other than whenever mm-hmm. you really start to develop your personal style, you will leave an impression and you will be memorable. And that's what having a personal brand is. It's simply making an impression and having a reputation and um, you know, like visually sharing on the outside what people can expect whenever they get a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. Or, but from here on out, I'm just talking about like cool clothes. Good. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And or I think there's like showing people on the outside what they can expect inside, but also just dressing in a way that makes you feel, regardless of other people's perspective, confident comfortable. I'm going to be talking about that a good bit today. Um, And we're talking like clothing style, but I also want to bleed this over into interiors because this is also something that I'm talking to a lot of my boss friends about. You know, we all get to these phases where we're buying houses, (laughs) friends who are getting divorced and moving into their first house by themselves and have the opportunity to really express themselves in their spaces and those sorts of things. Or maybe, you know, you're setting up your home office or whatever it may be. I think this bleeds over a lot into interior styling as well. And us as creatives and business owners who are here to, here to do things the way we want them done, I feel like we are naturally pulled to this idea of wanting our space and our like outward appearance to represent something, to really speak to who we are. And so I, I think this can just be a really fun one. And I'm excited about doing this with you because this makes up a whole lot of our just general conversations, right? Mm-hmm. What clothes yeah. we're wearing or what we've bought or found or some inspo 
or our spaces. We're always showing each other that like, you know, Facebook marketplace find that we got or how it is that we styled this corner in our house or whatever it may be. This is really what Kathleen and I are talking about behind the scenes in addition to food. Yeah, food, clothes, home. And on the clothes front, I'm also a lot of time asking what your daughter's wearing lately, like what she's into, what her style is. As she's becoming a teenager, I'm just so curious. And she's my child. So, of course, there's a. Yeah, there's a lot of stomping. I can tell you that. Kathleen walks around with very heavy feet. You can hear her coming from a mile away. And my kid does the exact same. I had told her the other day, like, please stop stomping the house. It's too old. It will fall down. (laughs) (laughs) It's a real thing. I also want to just note why I think it's important to have this conversation, have bosses hear this, um, is because... This sort of styling of yourself and your surroundings is a really easy way to, um, I don't want to say expend creative energy in a way that like you just want to get rid of it. But we do have a lot of pent up creative energy. Like we want to make something. We want to do something. And it's really easy for us to get into this idea as creative entrepreneurs that we then need to sell the thing, (laughs) right? But this is a great way to express your creativity in a way that does not make you money and just nurtures your life without you going and picking up like some other hobby. Like you don't need to go to the craft store (laughs) to be creative with the clothes you have in your closet. I mean, you might. You you might. You might. You can actually too. You might need to to. pick up a bedazzler. Um, How about I'm bringing a bedazzler to New Orleans? Wait, what? If you have anything you want bedazzled. So for a long time, I've had a joke with David's mom in in particular about bedazzling things. And this year for Christmas, she bought me a bedazzler. And I was so excited. It's not like the name brand one, but like it, it. it will put rhinestones on things. Is it rhinestones needed. and studs? Like, do you have all the things? Yes, I'm going to bring some things. Yes, bring whatever you'd like and we will bedazzle it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Do you yeah. have enough rhinestones? Oh my God, like thousands. Okay, okay. Thousands of rhinestones. Yes. All right. Bring whatever oh, you need. So I'm glad I know that you what we're going to be up. doing after our late <laughs> early dinner. We are going to be bedazzling yeah. some things and watching HGTV. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I've been meaning to tell you that I was bringing it. Um, because also, I was thinking about the other day, I have this bedazzler. And I keep like looking at it thinking, what am I going to bedazzle? Like, I don't even know. And I don't just want to sit there and do it by myself. And I can do it with my kid. That is not her style at the moment. Um, who else would I want to bedazzle with than a group of bosses? Yeah. Like who Who more than a group of bosses? So I threw it in my box of things that I'm taking to New Orleans so that we can bedazzle and then I can we can bedazzle with the C-suite bosses as needed. We're going to we're going to add rhinestones. Um. But I do want to bring up that earlier this week, I was hosting a new moon circle in the Being Boss Clubhouse. And one of the questions, because it was Pisces season at the time of recording, one of the questions was, how are you being called to express yourself creatively? And everyone had the the like gut reaction to want to go into something they wanted to create for their business. And then every one of them also followed that up immediately with, that's not what I should like go into immediately or like that's not the only thing I should do. And they either put what they were wearing or their space. And so even like like bosses are feeling this and they're getting it. So it just it all sort of wrapped up to be the perfect time to have this conversation. Let's do it. Raise your hand if you're feeling tired of wasting your precious time on tedious tasks like pulling reports, rewriting blog posts, and trying to personalize countless prospecting emails. Well, say no more, because I've got some new AI tools that are going to give you back your time. Introducing HubSpot's newest AI tools, Content Assistant and ChatSpot. 
Content Assistant uses the power of OpenAI's GPT-3 model to help you create content outlines, outreach emails, and even web page copy in just seconds. And in case that wasn't enough, they create a chat spot, a conversational growth assistant that connects to your HubSpot CRM for unbeatable support. With chat-based commands, you can manage contacts, run reports, and even ask for status updates. The easy-to-use CRM just got even easier. Head to HubSpot.com slash artificial dash intelligence to get early access today. Let's look at curating your personal style as I want to look at it through the lens of like you are expressing your true self, like outwardly on your body, in your space. I think this can be a little bit intimidating for some people, which is why I think it's fun for us to have this conversation because we're going to dive in as two hobbyists, right? No professional training. I didn't go to fashion school. I'm certainly not an interior designer, but we both do the things and we've both sought help. Like we've consulted with interior designers or stylist or whatever. So we we know just enough to get us in trouble. <laughs> so we're going to spread that trouble to you guys. So then let's start with where you would start, Kathleen. When it comes to personal style, where are you beginning? Well, I was born on May 5th, 1982. <laughs> and I came out of my mother's womb with some style. Right. I really do think yep. I know that you say that we're not professionals, but it, mm, kind of like, <laughs> you know, we styled ourselves yeah. for a photo shoot that was then on a book and on all over our website. Like we've done a lot of styling. And yes, um, just because we don't sell it doesn't mean that we're not well versed in it. So I will say that I, I really do think, though, looking back at <laughs> where on, you've been, on. this this is also literally my job at Almanac, which I had not actually considered at all. Like when it comes to what my job is in that business, really, really, it's making sure that store looks fabulous. And so, it does. No, I, I was incorrect. I was, <laughs> I was just telling my sister the other day about Almanac and how you are so naturally gifted at merchandising and setting up a space mm -hmm. and it just is beautiful. Like you are so, so good at it. Um, So yeah, all of that to say, I think that whenever it comes to being a creative and having an eye, if you are a graphic designer, which we both are, if you are a merchandiser, a retailer, you know, all the things, it's all the same principles. It's all about color, composition, creating a tone and a style. So we've got it. So let's not diminish, you know, what we've got whenever it comes to this sort of thing. But also speaking to the perspective of someone who might be a little bit more intimidated or not know how to find their style, here's where I would begin. So I would begin by looking back. And I have found that through my whole life, I've had certain points of inspiration and certain points of style that I've always gravitated to. So I would look back and think about from zero to seven, what were you wearing? Were you were you being dressed by someone else? I was dressing myself. And so I think that that was the beginning of really, truly my parents nurturing my own sense of style and me just picking out what it is that I wanted to wear and putting together combinations for better or worse, right? Um, and then thinking about my teenage years and what was I attracted to then? Funny enough, I've been coming back around a lot. And maybe because it's kind of what's in style now, like some 90s Y2K stuff is going on now. And so it really is reminiscent of that. But back then in the 90s, I was wearing a lot of 90s does 70s look and feel like I was wearing a lot of bell bottoms, a lot of like polyester matching, um, like jumpsuit type things. But like even as a kid, I was always really drawn toward military style. And okay, so this is another thing you might do is like look back on, you know, what your style has been throughout the years and what you've come back to over and over again. And I think that that is a big clue as to what some foundational pieces of your personal style are. Um, but thinking back whenever I was little, and I still do this now, I was always really inspired by characters in movies or shows. You know, I really 
wanted to be Sarah Connor and Ellen Ripley whenever I was a kid. And so at this time in my life, as I think I was in the sixth or seventh grade, I would wear combat boots and flight suits that I would find at the, um, it's not the thrift store, but what's it called? Like the army surplus, the army surplus store. I would find like Navy pea coats, flight suits, combat boots. I loved it. I had some like camouflage, like a lot of camouflage and I was mixing it in with band t-shirts and I'm still dressing like this today, basically. Um, But now my inspiration is probably a little bit more broad, but I do always come back to these badass women, like specifically Charlize Theron in Atomic Blonde and Mad Max. And, you know, thinking about Ellen Ripley, that's played by Sigourney Weaver in Alien and Aliens. Um, I'm also recently was really inspired by her character in Ghostbusters. So I find myself coming back to these women, whether it's characters or the actual actors and actresses themselves. Um, Another person I've been really inspired by lately is Natasha Lyonne, specifically in her show, show Poker Face. It's so cool. She has this like bohemian meets southwestern country meets kind of like mechanic, like working mechanic vibe. And so she's wearing things like flared black jeans and a t-shirt with cowboy booties and maybe a trucker hat with like a cool vintage 70s jacket. And I've just been so inspired by her. Um, So I would say, you know, look at one, look at things that have you've gravitated toward along the way your whole life, like what kind of vibe or style, and then look at maybe who you've been inspired by along the way and like look at what's changed and what hasn't changed. So like for you, Emily, what what has been a style point that you've come back to time and time again over the years or who have you been inspired by over the years? Mm, I a Wide leg pants, any color fabric, like what bell bottoms, yes, but wide leg pants are my favorite. And I think about for me, Jinkos. definitely like middle school, I remember. Yeah, absolutely. A brand that did not evolve well, let's just say. (laughs) They still exist in the world. You can go look them up. But they did not evolve well. They really missed an opportunity, I think, because I would buy them all. So wide leg pants is definitely my shtick. Um, I like to pair things together that don't necessarily go together or just like wear weird, interesting things. Not quite like flight suits. But think like animal print. Like I remember having like this leopard print jumpsuit in high school that I loved so much. And it was weird. (laughs) I remember getting some weird comments about it, but I loved it. And whenever I think about the threads of it, it's definitely I love clothes that don't touch me. (laughs) That's an ongoing thing and something I've, I've realized as I've gotten older. I like just like really flowy, like let me move around clothes. And I'm a sucker for neutrals. Like since I was a kid, since I was a kid. So I've always really enjoyed pairing together unexpected things. I do love a bold print. um, And I love things that are a little more baggy and flowy. If we can hearken back to that caftan comment earlier, that is my like ideal wardrobe piece, period. And when it comes to inspiration, You know, it's less people. I've never been like much of a TV watcher. There's a couple of ones. I'm really surprised you didn't bring up the craft. Like (laughs) I'm shocked, (laughs) actually. That wasn't at the top of your list. And I also think of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like definitely that like darker side, like strong women don't really care what other people think, like just going to wear what they want, but also practical because you might be slaying vampires, right? As needed. So little less people, where I've always gone back for inspiration, and this is such a funny thing considering everything, I think, but I have always loved streetwear, especially fashion week. Like if you look back at years and years of Pinteresting or whenever I think about like when I was a kid looking at magazines, I wanted like, I I was looking at what, um, what what are they called? Like movie stars? Like famous people. <laughs> what are they called? I don't know. What famous people wearing like streetwear. Celebrities. Thank you. That's the word. Um, so like the the streetwear sections in in the um in the magazines or like these days, I will still Paris Fashion Week, New York Fashion Week, Milan, doesn't even matter. Um, I am looking up 
street, like fashion week streetwear. And that is where I always gather probably the most of my inspiration and and whatever variation that is since I was a kid. I want to be incredibly practical, layered as needed, lots of neutrals, and don't touch me. (laughs) I just want them to flow, flow behind me. So that's where most of my inspiration has come from. I do love a really solid color palette. It's so it's less about like looking to inspiration in specific people or in specific places. And for me, it's definitely more of a mood. I think that I'm going for mood and comfort. I love what you were saying too, though, and looking at, so I, and I think you can go at this from whichever way, you know, there are the pieces that you had when you were a kid that you still remember of like, I, I wish I still had that pair of jeans or that shirt, like whatever that thing was that made you feel totally badass as, you know, a seven-year-old or whatever. Um, there are things like that along the way. And it's picking up the threads of what is the same between those things. For me, it's like, you know, baggy practical <laughs> or uh, neutrals with bold prints or whatever it may be. It's looking at those threads um, and finding them and recognizing what they are so you can start putting things together from that place. If you have a hard time doing that, I also think it's a great tactic to just look at what you currently have and what of it you like. So if you are thinking like, you know, I've always hated all of my clothes or, you know, I've never had a couch that I liked because we can also bring interiors into this. um, Just look around at what you do. Check out your closet. Look around your house. Is there like a shape of a table that you like, right? Or is there a shirt you currently have? Is it the fit? Is it the color? Is it the material? Is it the pattern? Is it the way you can pair it with, you know, five things in your closet, whatever it may be? Looking at what you currently have and identifying what you love and why you love it, I think is also a really powerful backbone for you to build onto to develop a personal style. I think also logistically a great place to start is with a Pinterest board. You know, just get on Pinterest Mm. and start curating and pinning um, anything and everything that you love whenever it comes to style. So just type in style, start pinning, and it will start populating the algorithm with more of that. So you might need to do a new search at some point so you don't fall down a rabbit hole that you're not necessarily resonating with. And you can just start pinning away. And then what you can do is pin without abandon. Then look at that board and start to notice patterns and themes. So is there a color palette that you're really attracted to? Like maybe you're pinning a ton of things that are green and didn't ever even think that you would like wearing green. You know, so take a look at what colors are showing up, what fits are coming up, what the kind of style and vibe is. And that's a really great way to start to see what it is that you're attracted to and then say, okay, do I, can I recreate any of these looks? Like, do I have stuff in my closet or in my home already that can elicit this vibe, you know, evoke this vibe? Um, Because here's the deal. Even people who have a ton of money can lack style. Like style isn't just about having all the money to buy all the things that you want. Style is 100% an attitude. And you can have badass style or whatever style you want without a whole lot of money. And what it is is by really narrowing in and pinpointing what are the pieces that you want, what do you have, how can you start to put things together in a certain way. You know, for me, style is really about the attitude. You were talking a little bit about this too, Emily, like the confidence and the attitude. It really is about the attitude that I want to embody and it's how I want to reflect that on the outside. So it's not only a way to signal to other people who I am and what they can expect from me, but it like really gives me the confidence to show up as a badass. So that's another thing that you might want to think about are like, what are a few adjectives or Um, words that you would use to describe your ideal style. So for me, whenever it comes to how I want to look and feel, and I've said this for many years now, I am dressing for the zombie apocalypse, you know, like the movie (laughs) version of a zombie apocalypse. So whatever I'm wearing, I want to be able to imagine wearing it for 300 days, traveling across the country to find my kiddo, 
with a slingshot in my pocket and a bow and arrow on my back and maybe a machete in my left hand, right? Like I just want to feel kind of like a a well-worn badass ultimately. So think about what your style adjectives are as well. And you can also do this by looking at your Pinterest board. So it might be, you know, feminine and bohemian with a little bit of rock and roll edge, or it might be really super classic bombshell. Um, I don't know, like, but just think about like what those different adjectives are whenever it comes to how you want to look and feel. And that can be a great touch point whenever it comes to buying new things or even editing your current wardrobe, say, you know, does this fit the vibe that I'm going for? Mm, I love that. You can also type those things into Pinterest. You can put like badass style, mm, worn well-worn style, sure, probably, <laughs> right? It'll give you plenty of things. I also think the algorithms there will give you like more common terms for the things that you're searching for. It's like Pinterest is such a great tool for this kind of thing. One of mine is is comfort, <laughs> which I've talked about a couple of times, but it's not it's not just comfort as in like, you know, sweatpants and and hoodies all day every day, though I do have a really great selection of those. It's more of this combination of of pairing like classic piece, classic and edgy pieces and layering in comfort into everything that I do. So, and I've also found that whenever you curate the pieces that represent what you're looking for, and then you put them together in a way that just feels good to you, even if it's unconventional, people feel it and they love it. So one of the things I've I've recently got up. It was a little cold here. I think it was going to be raining. I had to come into the shop and I put together the funkiest little outfit I think I've probably ever worn, but it was literally just, I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to be warm enough. I wanted to like, have to, if I had to get wet, it wouldn't like ruin anything. So I like put on my rain boots and I put on my pants and I, um, put on, um, like a sweatshirt and a blazer and then my like rainproof hat on top. And it was, it was weird. It was a weird outfit. And literally everyone complimented my outfit. And the first time I was like, dude, I literally just dressed for, to be comfortable. That is, was my only goal today was to be comfortable. Um, But when you have the right pieces and you put them together for whatever purpose you're putting them together for and you feel good in them, Like the whole vibe is there and people will feel it. Being boss is about more than taking care of business. It's also about taking care of yourself and not just so you can be great at work, but so you can enjoy your life. And when it comes to resting and sleeping, make the same investment in the tools that help you do it well as you do for those that help you with your work, which is where Cozy Earth comes in. Cozy Earth crafts luxury goods that transform your lifestyle with a line of women's loungewear that offers optimal comfort made from responsibly sourced viscose from bamboo. Counted as one of Oprah's favorite things and quickly becoming one of mine as well, Cozy Earth will help you feel like a boss comfortably and cozily as you work from home, get some shut eye or travel for work. Learn more and snag yours at CozyEarth.com. And Cozy Earth has provided an exclusive offer for Being Boss listeners. Get 35% off site-wide when you use code BEINGBOSS at CozyEarth.com. What about things that you are willing to spend money on? Because whenever it comes to Mm. really pinpointing your style, I do think it's a good idea to ease into it. And I know that people, a lot of people are against fast fashion and that's bad and wrong and all the things, but I think it might be a good idea to try some things that aren't so expensive so that then you know what it is that you want to invest in. You know what I mean? So yeah. I do this with actually makeup as well. Like I will buy kind of the cheaper cover girl version of a color that I'm wanting to try out before I'm spending the $30 on a lipstick that I'm not sure if I even like the color or not. So I think that you can do this with clothes as well. So check out places like Zara or H&M, but also thrifting is like a really great, I'm more on the thrifting side whenever it comes to mm. um 
my home style for sure. Like I love bringing in some weird thrift store and estate sale stuff into my house. I guess because it almost in some ways seems lower stakes than what I'm wearing. Like what I'm wearing feels so much more personal, even though my house does feel like this living, breathing entity on its own. Like it has this vibe of its own um, that I'm less in control of. Like I let my house itself really dictate what it wants to be, um, which is kind of weird to say, but I really do feel like I listen to my house whenever it comes to that style. Well, and I, I, that's a really great point to make because I do think staying true to the style that is already present in your house is important. I think for everything to feel cohesive, it, well, it's important if you want it to be important. If you don't give a shit and you're like, I'm stuck in, or I, I love my like, you know, mid century modern house, but what I really want is a, you know, plant filled jungalo, you do that. Love that for you. Um, but I do think there is something about letting a very prominent style of a house really lend very heavily to the style that you add to it um, in a way that you don't really have to do whenever it's your wardrobe, unless you have to dress in a particular way for your job, which I would imagine most of us listening to this probably don't have to do that very often. I feel like that's sort of a similar scenario. But it is quite true with your house. I want to come back. I want to talk about house and style just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, because whenever it comes to my house, I live in a really amazing mid-century modern house that was built in the 1960s. I've got wood ceilings. It's split level. I mean, it is funky, like funky 60s mid-century, but it was remodeled in the 80s. So I've got those like melamine, like the white melamine and oak um, cabinets in my kitchen. My A lot of my sconces are like mixed metal designing women, like gold and silver angular sconces. I've got a whirlpool in my uh, main bathroom. I mean, it is full on 80s remodel in like half of the house. And I love it. I love that someone came in in the 80s and remodeled this house that was built just a couple decades before. And so what I've really tried to do in my own home is blend this mid-century modern with like the 80s vibe. But also in the 80s, if you I'm really inspired by 80s kitchens like Golden Girls and Alf and Roseanne. And the really interesting thing about these 80s kitchens is that they're oftentimes referencing the 40s. Because if you're looking at kitchens in the 80s, they're wanting to do what was retro and classy, which was what was happening four decades before that, right? So you have to consider that as well. Like everything's kind of referencing each other and you end up in this hall of mirrors. But I really love that. So I started, you know, kind of modeling my kitchen in this 80s does 40s vibe with a bunch of copper tin molds, you know, like the ones that are like little fish and a lobster that looks like a penis and grapes and, you know, like the bunt cake pans and stars. So I have a whole wall filled with those because it's very golden girls and owlfish. I really, I wanted to keep the cabinets. Everyone was shocked that I love my cabinets. And a few people have even noted like, that's so cool that you just kept the cabinets and rocked them. And I have those cabinets and now I'm going to keep mine too. So you don't have to always do what other people are doing. And my house is not super Instagrammable, right? But whenever people come into my home, they are delighted. They're delighted by all of the art, all of the layers, all of the things in there, the incense burning, the music playing. It is about a layered and eclectic vibe that, again, my house itself is really dictating. But whenever it comes back to my clothes, I feel more in charge of my clothes. Like my house, she's doing her own thing. Like she's letting me know what she wants and what she does not want. But whenever it comes to my clothes, I feel like I'm really in the driver's seat there. So coming back to clothes, um. What are you willing to spend money on? Because there's a few things I dropped some coin on, and I'll let you all know what that is. Um, but what do you what do you spend money on? There's a couple of things, and I want to do clothes and maybe a little bit of furniture 
as well because or like a little bit of house decor as well because I think these two things like I think you'll see the sort of common threads here when it comes to clothes boots (laughs) boots are one of those things for me right like I will drop some coin on a good pair of boots like how much a couple hundred maybe the most I've ever spent was like three three fifty yeah, I've spent up to $500 on boots before. And that's yeah. a lot of money for me. Like, I do not spend a yep. lot of money on clothes. You all, I want Same. you to understand that I am also on Instagram wondering how all these people have all this money to buy all these designer things, right? So that is not us. Yeah. If you're listening to this right now, that is not us. We are not buying designer things. No, I, literally, I don't think I own a designer thing at all, actually. Same. No, I don't own anything designer. And whenever I talk about like dropping some coin on something, it's definitely like I'm buying one of these. Or in the case of boots, I have two or three really nice pairs, but they've also lasted me for years. Um, The first pair I bought, I bought five, six years ago. And those things are still stomping around with me on an ongoing basis. And I spent that much money on them because I wanted to have them forever because I loved them so much. I did not want them to be boots that um, were going to last me a season or two and then I have to chunk them. So boots and hats are two things that I will spend some good money on because those are like, those are also like exclamation points to outfits for me, right? Like, and in the case of shoes, are literally going to get the most wear because I'm stomping around in them. Not as hard as Kathleen is. <laughs> but boots and hats are two pieces of clothing that I will pretty ongoing. I do have cheap boots. I do have cheap hats. Um, but when it comes to seeing a price tag and going, okay, worth it. Um, I love that boots are something that I'm going to be wearing a ton. And hats, I like to think of as literally heirloom items. Like, my hat collection will go to my daughter and they will be like a good timeless hat will carry on for several more decades. Um, So I'm definitely thinking about them as long-term investments and literally heirloom items. Yeah. My most expensive pair of boots I've had now for 15 years and will easily have Mm. them for 15 more. And I still get compliments on them every time I wear them. Um, Same with hats. You know, whenever it comes to style, there are days I don't want to get dressed, but if I throw on a hat and a red lip, I'm Mm -hmm. good to go, you know, and people will be like, oh, you're fancy. And I'll say, I'm literally just wearing a hat. That's (laughs) it. I mean, there's not much more to it. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. The other thing that I'm really willing to spend money on, so like boots, jeans, I'm willing to wear spend more money on jeans because I'll wear them again for decades. Mm. There yeah. may be they See, may less not so. Have... I don't like jeans. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, jeans are a little tighter, like Yep. Yeah. Uh they don't, don't... like it. I will say style of jeans. I mean, what goes around comes around, but even jeans that I've had that have come back in style aren't quite right. So I would say that they don't have quite the same amount of lasting power as far as style goes mm. as maybe some boots do. And then the other thing I spend a lot of money on is my hair. And my hair mm. has become um, a really integral part of my style And it's always changing. So it's the thing that I know if I can get it right and I'm feeling good about my hair, I'm feeling good about everything else. Yeah. Hair's a good one. High five. I don't spend that much money on my hair. My hair is like it just kind of takes care of itself for the most part. We have very different kinds of hair. And you definitely use yours more than I use mine in terms of like defining your style. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and like how I show up in the world. You know, one other thing I want to talk about a little bit whenever it comes to style is really thinking about, and whenever it comes to especially investing in your style, whether that's in your home or your clothes, is really thinking about what you want to grow into. I think that really thinking about style as almost a manifestation tool or really kind of becoming who it is that you want to be is a great way to think about what you're going to purchase or what you're going to put on your body or what you're going to wear. And so for me, like yeah. whenever earlier we were talking about inspiration, lately I've been really thinking about way, way, way far back. So not just, 
you know, Sigourney Weaver and aliens, but I've been really inspired by how I visualize, you know, like my ancestors, my spirit guides, these ladies oh. that have come before. You about to bring corsets back? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> they are back regardless. They weren't. They my ladies were not wearing corsets. These were like badass <laughs> Viking women who are probably problematic, uh, yeah. but you know, these badass Viking women or witchy midwives, you know, and healers that were threatened to be burned at the stake. What, what were they wearing? And then also I think of um, whenever I think back on, you know, where I come from, I imagine I also come from a line of like these artsy feminists who were making things and creating things and um, living life on their terms before that was acceptable and okay for women. You know, yeah. so I really like to think about them and kind of making them proud with who I am now and how how they've paved the way so that I can wear these things or do these things with my hair and with my body. So that even when I think about that a lot too, even whenever I'm working out, like I think about drawing on the power of these really strong women that came before me and just having them look down at me and say, yeah, girl, you're a badass. You come from, you come from us and you're doing, you're making us proud. But then I also, on the flip side of that, whenever I think about style inspiration, I like to think about myself whenever I'm 50, 60, 70, 80, and I want to make her really proud too. And I want to start to, I want to meet her where she's at, you know? So for me, if time is kind of a spiral, I kind of believe that my 80-year-old self exists out there somewhere already, right? And so she's looking back at me now, and I'm looking forward to her, and we're going to meet in the middle. And I'm going to start making decisions now to make her proud, but also to make her who she is once I get mm. there. And so I know it sounds like... I've been smoking a lot of weed. I'm totally so sober high. right now. Love that for you. <laughs> <laughs> but this really is something okay. that I truly consider whenever it comes to style and being who I want to be. Like I don't want to become complacent or stop thinking about it. Like I really love it and I love it for my future self and I love it for the people who I've come from. And I just want to live it big and live it loud, whatever that looks like. That is deep. That's real deep. My extent of this is I like to think about what I'm going to wear the night before. <laughs> That's how I like to go <laughs> to bed at night. But I put myself to sleep going, what do I want to wear tomorrow? Like maybe I'll, I'll put on those pants and I wonder what it would look like if I tried it with that sweater or whatever. And then I wake up the next morning excited about getting dressed, which is a whole thing in itself. Um, Hold on, we were talking about investing things. I want to talk about collecting things really quick because I think this is an important thing to throw in there. I, I don't want anyone to think, okay, now I need to go like redecorate my bedroom or my office or like buy a new wardrobe. I think we're both from a place where, you know, you talked about boots you've had for 15 years. I've had my favorite pair of boots for like six. Um, you know, a collection of hats that I've been collecting over the past couple of years. I definitely, I have pieces from Old Navy that I have worn for 10 years. Like there is something about the accessibility of fast fashion and getting some really great timeless sort of staple pieces and just wearing the living shit out of them. Yes. Which is one of the things that I love to do. Well-worn. 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 And if you're fighting zombies, they're not asking you who you're wearing. <laughs> right? As long as it's comfortable to you <laughs> and it feels great and it goes with what you're doing. But there is this process of collecting pieces over the years. And I've been in my house for seven and a half years now. I was actually, I recently saw a photo of my living room right after we moved in. And it was like, it was bare. It was so, like, there was a couple things in there that I had brought with me, but not very many things. And whenever I look at my living room now, it is full of plants and great pieces of furniture and amazing art and all of these things. And it took me seven and a half years to collect everything from where I started then to where I am now. And for me, that's one of the things that makes a wardrobe and a space feel really special, not only to you, but people who come in, they can feel the 
they can feel that there are stories there, right? Like I remember, I remember when and where I was when I bought this hat. It was the last time I was in New Orleans, right? Or like the piece of art on my wall or whatever it may, like each piece has its own story. And it wasn't like, oh, I just got tired of all my clothes one day. So I went to, you know, Banana Republic and bought a new wardrobe. Um, there's something to mindfully collecting pieces and making that a part of your journey. I love to go to antique stores with no purpose in mind. Like just, let's just go see what we find. You pick up a nice little, you know, brass dish to put on your coffee table or a lamp or maybe nothing at all. Maybe nothing speaks to you at all. But there is this like, this collecting that happens. And even if things don't all necessarily go together, they do because you're the common thread. And so it all starts to make sense. So I love to mix. I love to mix things like, like mix some really old antique stuff with something that's a little more modern, something that's like incredibly functional and something that has no function literally at all. It just looks cool. I really do love to pair nice expensive things with my old Navy basics or whatever it may be. And that creates a style that is uniquely yours um, and is part of an ongoing journey, not just something you decide to do one day. Absolutely. This actually makes me think about how I'm also highly inspired by streetwear. I think earlier you were talking about street style, like kind of like off-duty celebrity style. So streetwear, there's this show on HBO Max called The Hype. And Offset is one of the judges, a woman named um, Buffy, and then Marnie, who is Beyonce's stylist. And it's a competition show where a lot of young designers are sewing and creating specifically streetwear style. So it's a lot of t-shirts, hoodies, sneakers, um, like cool, like jeans and slacks and things like that, right? So truly streetwear inspired by, you know, a lot of hip hop. And I can't help it, but like I love that too, even though it doesn't necessarily fit in with the zombie killing aesthetic that's kind of rooted in kind of like military inspired um, or, you know, like a little bit more like Laura Croft vibes, right? So whenever it comes to that, I will buy some Air Force Ones and mix them into what I've got going on or buy some hoodies. And so I really am finding inspiration from a bunch of different places. And it's not always even necessarily fashion, you know, like I'm not opening a fashion magazine Mm -hmm. or like you said, going to a store and buying everything off the rack. Um, Sorry, I'm going on tangents. Well, welcome me back to this show where I go off on all sorts of tangents. Just talking. But recently I was in this neighborhood that's like a new build neighborhood. I actually do a lot of branding for them. And I really love like this neighborhood is so cool and polished and all of the houses are brand new, but designed to look very different. And I was walking through this neighborhood and noticed, you know, kind of peeking inside the houses, every single house was furnished with like the same West Elm furniture and the same Mm. West Elm art. And it, they were beautiful and they probably look really great on Instagram, but it lacked a certain amount of soul, you know, and I even fall victim to this. Like I'm watching Leanne Ford and then want to paint my whole house white and become a minimalist. And that's just not, that's not what the soul of my house wants, you know, and then same with style too. I'm really sometimes tempted. And this is where I try things that might be a little bit more fast fashion-y and see how I'm able to integrate them into my wardrobe in a more permanent way or into my style in a more permanent way. And it can be really tricky. And I sometimes feel a little discombobulated or scattered. But over time, there's constantly this like curating and editing that happens. And that's the beautiful thing with age is now we've collected some things, we've gotten rid of some things. And through the decades, through the years, we've been able to figure out who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, I love that. Through the collecting, you discover who you are more so than, you know, you you use who you are to collect things. Or like just pinning things, you know, like kind of get off the internet and get into the real world, you know, even, okay. So talking about Pinterest, do you remember um, a while back, I told you that I was cutting things out of magazines and then like pasting them in a notebook? 
Yep. And it felt very creative and artsy to me to be just kind of creating like these little mini mood boards in a notebook. And what it really was doing is like a physical hands-on Pinterest because I was having to really choose, okay, what am I going to take the physical energy of cutting out and pasting and time is just not as fast, you know, and really developing style, it's not going to be fast. And you're going to make Mm. some mistakes, some expensive mistakes along the way. Lord knows I have. But that's how you start to learn truly who it is that you are and what it is that you want to project into the world and what you want to bring into your home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I think when it comes to collecting things too, I think having a couple boundaries in place, but also knowing when to bend your boundaries. Like what a, I will not splurge on anything white. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Like not a white shirt, not a pair of white pants, not a not a white set of sheets. Like they're going to be cheap. I'll have them, but they they're cheap. <laughs> Cuz it will like, the last white shirt that I bought I wore it for four hours and I got splattered paint on it. I don't even know how it happened. And so that like, I just know for myself, I'm never going to splurge on anything white. I'm never going to splurge on a shirt because like my armpits will devastate a shirt, (laughs) especially an expensive shirt. I feel like I sweat twice as much in an expensive shirt. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Because you're nervous about it. You're just nervous about it. (laughs) But I also think knowing when to bend your rules. So for a really long time. I would not spend a lot of money on a pair of sunglasses. Wouldn't do it because I broke them all the time, constantly breaking sunglasses until one day I was like, no, I'm doing it. I really wanted a pair of crew sunglasses and I bought them and like expensive sunglasses at that point, like I paid a hundred bucks for them. That was wild because I go through sunglasses like candy. Um, I, those I don't have anymore because I broke them, (laughs) but I have since bought another, I had them for a really long time, a really, really long time. And then I replaced them and I've had this pair for even longer. And I've definitely learned the power of investing in pieces and how that can literally help you take better care of things. So if you're wary about spending money on things because you, you know, you're not cool enough to, in whatever way you want to define that, because me in white shirts. Um, sometimes you need to break the rule to prove to yourself that you can you can invest in pieces. Um, I also want to talk about investing in pieces for the house really quickly. Art is something that I will spend some money on for sure, like a really great piece of art that, again, I think of it as an heirloom piece. This is not just something that's going to be in my house now. I would love to be able to decorate my kid's house with this piece, you know, in a couple of years. And I'm supporting an artist and doing all those things. And then also any piece of furniture that's going to be used a ton. Like if you buy a cheap piece of furniture, it's not going to last very long if it's being used consistently. So that's also something that I will do a bit of a splurge on. I have an Ikea couch that I love so much. It's an Ikea sectional. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about Ikea couches is that there's a couple of companies that make custom covers for Ikea couches. And so you could just change out the cover every, you know, couple of years. And that's an investment too. Like I think that the cover for my couch total ended up costing around six or seven hundred dollars, which seems like a lot for a fabric cover. But thinking about this couch lasting me, I think I'll probably have this couch forever, honestly. And then there's another couch that I bought downstairs that is literally from Wayfair, and it is a cheap piece of garbage, but I don't have the funds or the patience to buy the couch that I want to buy. So I just covered it with like a bunch of textiles that feel very eclectic and bohemian, and now you don't see the couch. So there are things that you can do that are cheap to, you know, elevate what you've got. Yeah, I think the point here is there are no rules. And maybe that's even where it becomes really difficult with for people is we want rules. We want to be able or we want someone to say, like, to make a great outfit, you need these four pieces. There you go right? Like in this color palette or, you know, whatever, here you go. Or to make a house cozy, you need these things in this sort of configuration. There you go. And what we've sort of, I think, shared here is that 
kind of like we navigate these creative journeys and we're just sort of like picking up skill sets and taking the opportunities and just like enjoying the ride. I think cultivating and and building your personal style is really similar. I think you can be very goal oriented like you are, right? <laughs> really think about your heritage as you go into it. Or you can just like figure it out on the fly like I do, <laughs> whatever it may be. Um, but it is something that you and I put a lot of like intentionality into. And not to say we're cute every day. I'm not cute every day. I will speak for myself. No. Quite happy. And not to say every corner no, of my you're house. Not. Is... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thanks. And you're not to cute say all the time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and not to say that like every corner of my house is a beautiful vignette because my guest room still needs some work. But it is a journey that we're on to create wardrobes and spaces that feel good to us. Um, and it's collecting pieces that mean something to us along the way. Or even if they don't mean something to us as we're collecting them, we add meaning to them as we go. Yeah. You know, Here's the deal that I've had to learn the hard way is that everything that you see in Architectural Digest or on those Instagram feeds or, you know, even street style for New York Fashion Week, those people are putting a lot of effort into making their home or their outfit look that way in that moment. It does mm. not always look that way. There are professional prop stylists who are coming in and styling these amazing, beautiful homes even more before it's shot for a magazine. It's lit really well. Um, you know, you're you're not seeing the armpit stains or the coffee stain or the paint splatter. It's been photoshopped out or it's a brand new piece that hasn't been lived in yet. You know, so real life does not look like Instagram. And I'm saying this for myself more than anyone because I so badly want my wardrobe and my closet and whenever I'm wearing my clothes and my home to look like that. And it just doesn't. And that's a good thing. So you talked about your guest room needing a little bit of work. Well, I've stayed in that guest room multiple times and not at once was I thinking, hmm, this could use a little work. You know what I remember <laughs> from our time together is the meals that we shared around your kitchen island and yeah. the hikes that we went on. It's not really about um, what it all looked like. It's about how it makes you feel. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind too. Your home, it's about how it makes you feel. Your clothes, it's about how it makes you feel. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I love that. And that's what people do read. That is what they read off of you, off of the space that you're in, whatever. They can tell if you love it or not, if you feel great in it or not. Um, they can feel that the presence of those feelings as you've collected and put things together. That's beautiful, Kathleen. Well, this has been okay, a can, treat. Can we end this episode by um, telling people what we're wearing right now? Oh, yes. Let's do it. You go first. Okay. I am wearing an ALF shirt and it says, mm -hmm. no problem, exclamation mark. So an ALF shirt and then a really cozy sweater that I got from The Gap. It's kind of like a brown camel color sweater. My ALF shirt is yellow with like a picture of ALF on it. I actually had this shirt whenever I was about eight or nine and I was telling Jeremy how much I loved this shirt and he found it for me and got it for me. And then I'm wearing some Madewell jeans, which is one of the few brands that fits my booty. And they're like high-waisted black skinny jeans that flare out at the bottom with a slit up the side. And then I'm wearing my house shoes because I'm working from my house. And then a couple of gold necklaces. Always got some gold on. Love it. You do. It, it's it's such a vibe. You have such a like – it's like – cozy vibe, but there's like a hint of Mr. Rogers with that cardigan. I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I currently have like a shaggy mullety haircut. I should mention that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I am wearing, I have, I'll start with my hat. I have a black like wide brim hat on. It's a Goran Brothers. Got it from New Orleans last year. I wear it 
so much. Um, and today, not because my hair is dirty. I'm actually like I'm in that weird in between place growing out my hair because it's been like chin length for the past year and a half. I'm growing it out. So now it's just like that weird, like brushing my shoulders length that just does not look great on me. So it's, my hair is usually in a ponytail, have a hat on black hat. I'm wearing a um, record label t-shirt. It's actually white. <laughs> it's a white t-shirt. Black letter says single lock records. Um, it has Alabama and a heart on it. It's a whole thing. Also gold chain. I have on a linen blazer, like a natural colored linen blazer. A pair of, <laughs> these are brown old navy pants, like almost chino style, but like a little stretchier. And I think they're probably two or three sizes too big. Like I put them on this morning and held out the waist and there was like inches <laughs> of space. <laughs> and so they're high waisted, pulled up, very baggy. I have on a pair of Halloween socks that are hocus pocus <laughs> and a pair of lug sole Doc Martens. Love it. Mm-hmm. So, like, for me, it's, like, I am actually combining black and brown real hardcore today. Oh, that's my favorite color combo is black and brown. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention this. Yep, yep. I'm always usually wearing black jeans with a brown belt. And then I've got some, like, black boots that have a brown sole on them. I love breaking some old school mm. rules. Like, you can't mix black and brown. That's some bullshit. Yeah. I love doing it, too. And mine's very color blocky, too. So I'm very much so mixing black and brown today. This is one of my favorite outfits. It's super comfy, looks pretty professional, but I'm just like incredibly comfortable. That's the vibe. Settling yourself into the flow of your business from navigating a whole year of ebbs and flows to embracing the energy of each and every day, you're bound to have some ups and downs along the way. For me, this journey of entrepreneurship is made better when my space keeps me focused and inspired. As an example, my favorite way to mark the beginning and ending of the workday is to light a candle when I sit down at my desk and then blow it out when I'm done for the day. It's a little ritual that creates boundaries and a vibe that keeps me focused and feeling cozy. And the ritual candle that we make at Almanac Supply Co. is my favorite for this. In fact, my whole shop is filled with items that I've curated to create the vibe for feeling connected, in flow, and inspired. With candles, crystals, and other goodies to help you create a dreamy workspace, bedside table, or bookshelf. Come gather inspiration and check out my favorite in-stock items at almanacsupplyco.com slash beingboss and get 15% off with code beingboss at checkout. That's almanacsupplyco.com slash beingboss. Now, until next time, do the work, be boss.